All right. Well, everybody, we want to welcome you to uh, the Wednesday night Bible study. Um, Daniel kicked this thing off a couple weeks ago. And so uh, Nathan, he, he said he'd like to do this, you know, a switch off. And he asked me if uh, we'd want to tag team on this. So, so that's what we're going to try tonight. So y'all just bear with us as we try to work out the bugs on this. But tonight we're going to look at Psalms 23. It's probably the most, not only the most popular psalm, but there's a chance it might even be the most common and popular Bible uh, passage in, in the whole world. But in order for to get to Psalm 23, you have to understand Psalm 22. And not that we're going to go over that tonight, but Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm, and it's about the cross. And uh, yeah, we're doing this in a way that we got kids running around too, so bear with us. But, you know, when you look at Psalm 22, it starts off, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then we see, you know, the psalm just is a prophecy of Jesus on the cross. And if it wasn't for Jesus going to the cross and dying for us, then Psalms 23 would not mean anything to us. But because of what Christ did on the cross, that's why we can have such joy and rejoicing in Psalms 23. So with that being said, Nathan's going to kick us off. We're going to cover a couple verses tonight, and he's going to start us off in verse 1. All right, well, let's get started. In uh, Psalms 23, verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Uh, notice when it starts off by saying, The Lord. My mind always goes back to Exodus uh, chapter 3, uh, when Moses is uh, getting sent uh, to go back into Egypt and he, he asked the Lord, he said, well, who do I say sent me? And God responded with, uh, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That name literally means I am who I am. Uh, that name is inexhaustible, just like it's bearer. Uh, that name shows us some things about God. One, that he is timeless. And the other is that he is self-sufficient. Self-sufficient meaning that he lacks nothing. He is all-powerful. He needs no power. Uh, he needs no wisdom because he has all the wisdom. Uh, that he has to answer to nobody besides himself. Because he is God. He is the great I Am. And... Uh, also in Exodus 34, when Moses is going back up the mountain to have the tablets uh, redone by God because he broke the first set because he was angry at the Israelites for uh, molding a golden calf. And the Lord reveals himself, his name to Moses again. And it says that then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth who keeps his loving kindness for thousands and forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And Moses made haste to bow down low towards the earth and worship. So we see that the Lord is merciful. We see that he's gracious and we see that he's abounding in loving kindness. Uh, but at the same time, it says that he will not clear the guilty uh, because we know that God is a holy God and that he is a just God that he must punish sin. And uh, so when we look at this, knowing that Christ died for his sheep and we see David declaring that the Lord is my shepherd He's speaking as one who is identifying with the Lord, one who knows his shepherd's voice and follows him, which is exactly what John 10, 27 says. It says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So we see that a shepherd's voice is distinct to the sheep. Uh, the sheep won't hear another voice. Uh, if I was to go into a shepherd's field and I called out to the sheep, the sheep simply would not come because it was not a voice of the shepherd. It was a voice that could bring uh, destruction. It could be a voice of a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, they would know that it's not a voice of one that protects and cares for the sheep. 
So the sheep will just not pay heed to the voice. But when the true shepherd calls out the sheep by name, the sheep respond and they come. Just as we, when the Lord called us to faith and repentance, we came. When uh, he grabbed our heart of stones, turned it to a heart of flesh, and uh, made us alive in Christ, we responded in faith and repentance. So we see that these sheep, they need a shepherd. But the question is, well, what exactly is a shepherd? Uh, David, of all people, would know who a shepherd was. I mean, from a young age... Uh, he was a shepherd. He understood what a shepherd needed to do. A shepherd assumes the well-being of the sheep because sheep, they can't take care of themselves. They don't know where the green pastures are. They don't know where the water is. They, they're, they're, if you want to be honest, they're kind of just the dumbest animals there are. Uh, they need constant oversight over them because they're continually in, in danger to wolves, thieves, robbers, uh, falling off cliffs. And uh, so these sheep, they need a shepherd just as we need a shepherd. Uh, and that's one thing that stands true is that we need a shepherd because without Christ, the Bible tells us that we're nothing. We're just lost. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. And, and there is literally no hope for us. But we see that when he is my shepherd, it says that I shall not want. Uh, but notice what, it, what a shepherd is not. It, it's not a... A shepherd is not a cattle driver. It's not one who pushes, who, who herds, but it's, it's, it's one who leads. It's one who has a, a great uh, compassion over the sheep to take care of them. So one thing that we might ask as us who identify with the Lord, well, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for, for my paycheck? Uh, because there's so many people getting laid off. What does that mean for my job? What does that mean for me providing for my family? Uh, but remember, the Lord is our shepherd, so we know that he is leading us, that he is guiding us, that he is protecting us, and that he will provide for us. So even, even in these times, he strengthens us, and he gives us joy, and he gives, this, gives us this hope and understanding that Man, he's our shepherd. And if God is, is inexhaustible, if he needs nothing because he literally supplies everything, he feeds uh, the birds of the air, and how much more are we to him than they? So we know that he works all things to our good and to his glory, and, and we can take hope in that, knowing, right. knowing that. But one thing that I do want to focus on for a little bit is that what David said. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, to me, it's one of the sweetest words in this verse, that, that word my. He does not say that the Lord is the shepherd uh, to the whole world at large and that he leadeth forth the multitude as a flock. But he says, the Lord is my shepherd. If the Lord is not anyone else's shepherd, he is mine. I'm identifying with him. I, I, I want the Lord as, as my shepherd because he cares for me. He watches over me. He preserves me. And notice there is no if, there is no but, there is no I hope so. But he says that the Lord is my shepherd. He has full dependence on the Lord as his shepherd. So one question that I would like to pose for you who are listening is, can you say that? Can you say without a shadow of a doubt that the Lord is my shepherd? And what that means is, is have you surrendered your life and everything that you are to him, that you entrusted your soul to the Lord Jesus Christ? Because just the belief that says, yeah, I believe in him. Well, the demons believe in him and they tremble, but there's, there's something that sets, sets the demons apart right. and those who truly believe, in, and that's obedience. Uh, not that salvation is built upon our works, but because of our salvation, we will have works and we will have obedience for what Christ has done for us. So the Bible does tell us that we need to test ourselves and know that we are in the faith. And a few places that we can go to do this is in 1 John. Uh, in 1 John 1, 6, it says, If we say we have fellowship with him, but walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And in verse 8, it says, 
If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we must know right off the bat that we are sinners, that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And you must realize that, that about you. And in 1 John 2, 4, it says, The one who says that I have come to know him and does not keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. You see, you, you can't identify with the shepherd, but then go do everything opposite of what he tells you to do. The, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And that's what this verse is, is laying out there to us. And then finally, in 1 John 3, 9, it says, No one born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, one thing that I do want to point out is that this does not mean that we're not going to sin. I, I want to point out that it says uh, no one born of God practices sin. That's yeah. why there's no such thing as a... Uh, it's not a continual habit. Yeah, it's not yeah. a continual habit. There's, there's no uh, drug addict Christian or no homosexual Christian. There's, there's any implant, any habitual addiction to this sin that you will not give up because God is a good father and he says that he disciplines his children and he will lead you back into paths of righteousness he will bring you back through repentance and he disciplines his children and that's why it says that you cannot that word cannot is one of ability you do not have the ability to do this because God is a good father and he does discipline his children when we when we wander off and screw up now, there might be times that we're down in the dredges really screwing up. And sometimes we can take it kind of far, to be honest. But then the Lord, he, he grabs you and he convicts you because you're his. And we know that he takes care of his sheep. He tends his sheep and he feeds his sheep. So my question is, is, is this you? Can you say without a shadow of a doubt that the Lord is my shepherd? And it, and one thing I would like to point out is in the bigger picture of all of this, as we was praying before we, we started, you know, uh, the Lord simply could have shut down the whole world so that someone could hear this message, so that someone could hear and believe in the gospel. As Jesus said when he entered his ministry in Matthew chapter 1, verse 15, he said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Uh, what do you think that means, Ronnie, when he, when he says that? Repent and believe in the gospel. Will you kind of give us a, a rundown of what he meant right there? Well, the command to repent is that when God opens your eyes and you're able to see what your life is outside of him, meaning you're a sinner, and even if you don't see it completely, you understand where you're headed. He's saying, turn around. You're, it's changing of your mind. And you're coming into agreement with God and what God has said about you. So you turn around, and then what you're doing is when it says to believe, you're, you're, you're putting your faith, you're trusting in Christ and what he did. And then, you know, even like what we're talking about tonight, the Lord is my shepherd. When that takes place and we repent, we turn from our sins, and we turn to Christ, that's when he becomes our shepherd when that work of regeneration happens in our hearts. So that's, I mean, that's just a short answer, but that's really what happens when, uh, when that command comes, repent and believe. So, yeah. And, the, you know, and for those who, who, who do believe in Christ, that he had came into this world, lived the perfect life, did all the works that we could not do. He received the punishment that we deserve for our sins, that he died upon the cross, that he was buried and three days later, rose again those who who believe that are what the bible declares those who are saved but that belief like i said earlier is not a belief of just simple simple head knowledge you know because like i said the demons believe but but that belief will really show in your life you will see a life of obedience you will see a life of sanctification now i know not everyone starts off just a full-blown christian right who, who uh knows everything uh a well, lot of times it's just a yeah. lot of repenting and even even in the uh the life of sanctification and obedience it's not a perfect obedience it's not a perfect repentance so that's one thing you want to remember is that it's where your 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 desire is to pursue christ 
And in that, we're going to we're going to come short. I'm not trying to give a license to sin or say it's okay, but just know that we're not looking at a perfect repentance or a perfect obedience in the sense that we'll never sin. But even when we do, it's our desire to turn away from that sin, confess it, and to pursue Christ. So, so then one thing at the end of this verse uh, that is that is great that's a promise to christians so i want to point that out it's 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 for for the believers and he it says is. the lord is my shepherd i shall not want uh in isaiah forty six ten, it says declaring the end from the beginning from ancient times things which have not been done saying my purpose will be established and i will accomplish all my good pleasures we have this assurance that god is in control of all things that god is completely sovereign and everything so as, as christians we can take comfort in this we can take comfort in knowing uh, the things that god has declared that he works all things to our good and for his glory uh but i want you to know too that sometimes what we perceive as good uh a lot of times doesn't look like that you know you know uh we go through trials we go through tribulations we go through heartache but we know that god works all those things for good and to our glory to his glory not to our glory uh he works it for our good and his glory and that's just something that we can take comfort in and knowing that we shall not want and one thing that uh, john calvin said he he said we must not forget that our greatest happiness is to have god's guiding hand stretched out over us to live under its shadow so that his providence may wash over our safety. Yeah. Uh, one more thing is J James Montgomery Boyce said, but if we belong to the one who is self-sufficient, inexhaustible, and utterly unchanged by time, we lack nothing. He is sufficient for all things and he will provide for us. Those are things that we can take comfort in in knowing that Christ is our shepherd. When we say that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, uh, Ronnie, you're going to go into verse two and, and kind of lay out some things, what, what, what that looks like and, and how he makes us lie, lie down in green, green pastures. Yeah. If you want to take over and lead us through that. Yep, you bet. Okay, so I'm going to read just verse two is short and I'm going to read it and then we'll look into it. He said, he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. Or if you're reading a King James or New King James, he leads me beside still waters. Um, you know, in light of, of what we're going through in the world right now, the pandemic of the, the coronavirus and all that, to get the, the, the gist of this, that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. You know, one of the things that we need to understand is this. Um, this, this. This verse two is broke up into two things. The first part is when it says he makes me lie down, he is leading us to, to have rest. And that rest is to have a rest, a, a contentment, a peace in our shepherd. Now, in order for, for sheep, for them to, uh, to be able to lie down, it takes four things, and four conditions need to be met for sheep to lie down. And this is these are the four things. One is they have to be free from fear or anxiety. You know, that's something that we deal with right now. In, in this coronavirus, uh, you know, three, four weeks ago, they said, well, it's gonna be a couple weeks, and man, there was so much, you know, people just running around, and I mean, and it affected all of us to a certain degree, you know, one or another, but, but for, for his people, his sheep, to be able to lie down, we have to be free from that. Okay, so the second one is this. We have to be free from strife. And, and I'm just going to say this, Christians, listen. Even as this is going on, there's been a lot of strife between believers in how to handle this. On things uh, just pertaining to you know, church services and things like that. How, you know, should we have church? Should we not? Listen, for God's people to be able to, to have that peace and just to be able to, to rest and reflect in Him, we have to be free of that. 
The third one is this, we have to be free from hunger. If sheep are hungry, they cannot relax. And so the only place that we're going to be fed is in God's word. We have to be in the word of God. So church, listen, as, as we're going through this time right now, are you in God's word? I mean, are you free from that hunger? I'm not talking about a physical hunger, but I'm talking about that, that we're, we're hungering and we're thirsting for righteousness. Another way of saying that would be to hunger and thirst for Jesus himself. And where are you going to find that? You're going to find it in the word of God. And then the last thing is this. We have to be free from like flies or, or pests or gnats. Sheep, they would get a lot of moisture around their nose and their eyes and stuff. And I know this much. I, I did a job years ago and I was working by a river and I was about 18 years old. And early in the morning, gnats would just be all over my face. It will drive you absolutely insane. And that's the way sheep are. They'll, these things will just be all around them and they cannot relax. So what happens is our shepherd comes along and to free us from this fear and this anxiety, we have to have this sense that because he is in our midst, this shepherd is in our midst, talking about Jesus, that we don't, we don't have that fear. We don't have that anxiety of predators and things because we are resting in Christ. And so, you know, in that strife amongst one another, listen, church, um, it could be in your marriages. It could be just amongst one another in a, in a local assembly. But picture this. Picture if Jesus was physically standing in your midst. I suspect that all that strife would leave. And that's what we have to do. We have to get ourselves to a place like that. And again, he feeds us in his word, but we have to actually pick the, the Bible up and, and to read it and to, to pour ourselves into it. And so, you know, our, and oh, and, and one thing about this, when he, about this free from uh, the pest and the things that would be, you know, and what that does, that affects your mind. But a shepherd would take a balm and he would rub it on their nose and around their eyes. And it was like, you know, it was like some powerful, like off or something like that. And it would keep those from them. And so when that would happen, they were able to, to lie down in peace. Now, one thing about this, when it starts off, it says, he makes me lie down. And so what we see is this is the active presence of the shepherd. It's, it's the shepherd doing what he does in our life that he is the cause of, of why we're able to lie down. And so what this is, it's speaking of when the sheep have been fed, they're free of threat of predators and pest and hunger. Now, Nathan, I don't know how you are, but when when you feel these things, it's hard to relax, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and let's be honest, when, when we feel, uh, you know, like, and these pests and stuff would be the things like, you know, we can be watching the news at night. Every night it's changing. If we're letting that be what comes into our minds and we're not focusing on the shepherd, there's no way you'll have any, any rest. You will be doing exactly what you're not supposed to be. We're, you know, in, in Philippians 4, he says, be anxious for nothing. He's saying, don't worry about anything, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Christian, listen, are you doing that in this time that we're living in? And so in order for you to be able to just rest in the Lord, that has to happen. And also, um, when we're talking about this, just remember this, that this is a, it's a resting in the presence of the shepherd. And I've said that several times. I'm just going off my notes. You ought to see my notes. These are mine, chicken scratch, compared to Nathan's. They're all typed and neat looking. So maybe Some people I'll, are better I'll, prepared for stuff. I'll make him. Other people wing it. Yeah, I, I'm kind of a wing it kind of guy. So uh, now you know the secret's out. So, okay, so look, when he talks about green pastures, he's talking about pastures of, of tender grass. That's what that literally means. And so this, is, this isn't like a mature field. It's like a young, it's like a young, uh, I don't know if I'm probably putting the words right, but it's like fresh grass. And these pastures, listen, they're always rich in nutrients, they're always plentiful, they're always good, and you can never exhaust them. Now, that is where every Christian wants to be. 
We want to be resting in the Lord. Now, let me say this. This can happen even in the midst of a trial. Yeah. I mean, you, Nate, you remember the story when Jesus, um, he was asleep in the bottom of yep. the boat. And the disciples were on the boat, and a storm comes up, and they think they're going to die. And some of these guys are professional fishermen. Yeah. They knew what it was like to be on that sea, but they think they're going to die. And they wake him up, and Jesus comes out there, and he says, you know, peace be still. And the storm is calm immediately. And they're like, what manner of man is this? Well, this manner of man is our shepherd. So even in the midst of trials and, and tribulations and temptations and all of these things, we can lie down in this in these green these green pastures and so um one last note on this part is this when we're lying down this is a time that we're able to to stop and what we're doing is we're reflecting upon the lord and his goodness and part of that's going to come from from getting you know in the word of god again but it's just that time that you stop and you can think about the things that God has done for you in your life, how he has protected you, how he has provided, and he's done all these things. And so the second part of this verse is he says, um, I'm doing this without my glasses. So he says, he leads me beside quiet waters. Now, one thing you need to know about sheep is this, is that sheep, they... They will not drink from like a loud uh, stream. Like, you know, we used to live in Montana and there was this river we would go to. And I mean, when you was at the bottom of it, where you first hit the trailhead, it was, I mean, you could hear it from the parking lot. It was, it was roaring rapids. But as you hiked up the trail, everything widened out and it was the most peaceful, serene setting. This water, it was just looked like glass. Well, and it was moving very slowly through there. You could take sheep and they would drink from there. But not only is it speaking of, of quiet and still waters, but, um, but it was talking about deep and clear and clean water too. So that's one thing about that. Now what this is really speaking of is this. This is the Holy Spirit refreshing us and causing us to drink deeply. And so I want to do something real quick. And uh, I want to contrast that briefly with Jeremiah 2.13, where he says this. He says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that, cisterns that can hold no water. So my question to you is this. What are you drinking from tonight? Are you drinking from this water where the shepherd's leading us? Or have you tried to create your own cistern, one that cannot hold water? And these are the things of the world where you're trying to get your refreshment from something you know that's, that's man-made or something this world has made. So it's only going to come when we are are you know following the shepherd in this life. I think that's one good thing to point out there is you know the Lord is is always leading in paths of righteousness. That's what verse three says is that He guides me and. And paths of righteousness, but it always comes down to, are you following? Are you following? Yeah, that's that's where it's really going to come down to. So you know, this twenty third psalm is not just a psalm that you know it's for a plaque on your wall. This is this is such a, uh, it's not only a promise, but it's something that we can treasure in the sense that just like you said, and I love how you brought that out. The Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd. He's not just a shepherd. He's not just got some sheep, but he is mine. That's personal. That's intimate. Yeah. And he says, I shall not want. Um, you know, one thing in there is that we have no desire for other things besides the shepherd. And so this shepherd, I'll just bring this kind of like this. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He's the one that does this. He's the one that leads us. So the you know the first point was he makes us stop and now he's also the one that leads us. So that being said, we've taken up probably more than enough time tonight. So um, I think one thing to point out real quick is 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 uh, when you said that, and we can draw it back to you know we're speaking about paychecks. You know what are we going to do in this time? And and you know he tells us I shall not want. 
And as we were speaking about earlier, you know, it comes down to your heart. What is your greatest desire when you when you lose these things, when when life seems like it's falling down on you? Are you going to feed from God's word? And in feeding there, are you, can you honestly say that I shall not want because I have this? Just like Paul said in Philippians, you know, he said, I, I count it all a loss for the sake of knowing right. Christ. So with this 23rd Psalm, I... I want you to understand that this is for the believer, that this is for those who, who say that uh, Christ is my shepherd. And I pray that that is what you can say today too. And, and if not, uh, man, the, the, as Jesus said, and as I read earlier in, in uh, Matthew 1.15, it says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And yeah. if... if if the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of your heart, and I pray that he is, I pray that this time was set apart specifically for you who do not believe, that you know that Christ came into this world, that he lived the perfect life, the life that you could not live, and he died a death that you deserved, and that he died in your place. Three days later rose again for you who would call upon the name of the Lord. And it says that you will be saved. And I pray that this time that God has sovereignly set apart. Who would have thought all this would have happened and we would be sitting around your table giving this Bible study. But it, it's assurance for the believer and it's, it's a time for repentance and belief for the unbeliever. So I, I pray that this has strengthened you, that it's given you wisdom and knowledge of God's word and what he has said to us. And... Uh, Ronnie, I thank you for having us out here. Hey, it was great. It was our privilege. Uh, yeah, anytime, man. I loved it. Loved having you all out. So.